Hello, Global Gardeners, and welcome to this Monday after Christmas with the new year fast approaching. It's great to see you all here today on the last Gardening Week Live of 2021, and we'll start all over again next year, of course. Great to see everybody checking in. Let's give a shout out to YD, a member of the Gardening Scott channel. Great for signing up. Appreciate it. This is a good opportunity to get some more in-depth information, joining our Facebook group, seeing additional live streams at the different levels we have. Uh, great to have you here, YD. I want to give a shout out to the Kitchen Garden with Eli and Kate, who are joining us here today. A great channel that you should be subscribed to, the Kitchen Garden with Eli and Kate. They do a wonderful job with their videos and showing how they grow in Scotland. So once again, we have a great global audience of everyone signing on today. We're going to focus primarily on some resolution ideas and how to actually keep the resolutions you make within the garden this year. So I'd love to hear your thoughts if you have already made some res resolutions gardening resolutions or if you're planning to make some gardening resolutions and we'll talk about that as we proceed coastal gardens northwest hi back to you hope you had a great christmas i did I had a really good christmas sent spent it with my daughter and grandkids and we played some games and had a nice rib roast uh it was it was a nice day so hope all of you who celebrated christmas had a, a wonderful christmas as well as we venture into the new year lots of discussion going back and forth with the temperature extremes that we have and Bari mentioned that they're at minus 40 degrees and this is something i learned many years ago one of those little tidbits that you bury away and you never forget at minus 40 degrees the fahrenheit and the celsius scale match so minus 40 is the same in Celsius as it is in Fahrenheit. So you don't have to worry about multiplying by nine fifths and adding 32 or multiplying by five ninths and subtracting 32. When it's minus 40, it's minus 40. And that is cold. So stay warm and I hope you can recover from that and the temperatures warm quickly. Renato Luna is a shout out now as a member of the Gardening Scott community as well. Uh, I think it's great to be a channel member. There really are some nice perks. This is one of those things that, that YouTube is doing more and more. They're pushing out to we as create creators to establish memberships. And so you're seeing more and more channels that are offering the opportunity to become a member of that channel. I encourage you to check that out as an option. It's a great way to support channels if you're looking to support some of the favorite channels you subscribe to. But then look at the perks. And I think that the, at the Gardner Scott community, we've got some, some really nice perks that, that I can offer to the members. And not everybody offers the perks. For some channels, it's just an opportunity for people to help support the channel. And that's definitely something that you can do on the Gardner Scott channel. But I really like the community that we develop at that 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 next level for for the community members as we we join up on Facebook and share pictures and stories and videos of what we're doing. It's really a nice option. So um, great to see you as a member as well. Thanks for joining. Good morning to Frank. My resolution is staying on top of my harvest this year. That is a fantastic resolution. I make that resolution every year. I get a little bit better at it each year, but I, I just have so, so many things that I don't end up harvesting. And Mala is actually helping me out because she is still bringing in tomatoes and carrots and things that I didn't complete a harvest with. And uh, almost on a daily basis, we've been so warm our soil has not frozen like it normally does. And so Mala is still out there digging up the carrots and whatever else she can find. So great resolution, Frank. I hope you could keep that. And we'll talk a little bit more about keeping resolutions here in a little bit. Heidi says, my resolution is to put in more raised beds, more work, but I need more room to try different vegetables. Great resolution <coughs> as well. 
and uh, containers fall into that category too. Uh, that's that was what I did uh, two years ago was to resolve that I would be doing more container growing. And, and that was actually the year I started making some more videos on how to grow in containers because I hadn't done much of that. So uh, good resolution for you, Heidi. Glad to hear that. Good morning to Linda from Cottage Grove, Oregon. 28 right now with six inches of snow. That's fantastic. I, I think we're right now, our forecast is for snow on New Year's Eve. And I sure hope we get it. We we had a dusting on Christmas Eve, just out of the blue, wasn't forecast. It just happened for a couple minutes, but we still haven't had any of the snow that we're supposed to have. We're really hurting. So um, I'm envious of those of you who are, are getting some good snow in an area where you're expecting snow. Dustin Light says, my resolution is to keep up with neem oil spraying. That's another good one. Uh, and so neem oil is, is a great organic method for pest control. The, the neem oil itself uh, disrupts the, the internal processes of the different insects. And so depending on the insect, it, it actually causes them to kind of go crazy uh, and disrupts the way they eat. For, for other insects, it disrupts their in internal digestion and so they can't digest the food that they're eating so it affects different insects in different ways but it's a great organic con pest control the issue is that it's not one of these spray it once and walk away and expect that it's going to work for the whole season you got to keep up with it so that's a good resolution because uh, i've i've fallen prey to that as well where i've sprayed neem oil on um, some indoor plants for scale that was developing and it worked great, but if you don't reapply it occasionally, you're going to have those pests return. And so that was kind of a fighting battle within my own uh, act actions is to keep up with the neem oil spraying. So uh, that's a real good resolution. Uh, Llama Llama says, morning to all. Two feet of snow in Northern California. That's awesome. Yeah, I saw that the Sierras were supposed to get a lot of snow. Two feet. That's incredible. I'm glad to hear that. It's always nice to to see people are getting the the, the snow when some of us aren't. Brian's planning on more diversity along with perennial cover plants. Uh, another great one. I, I'm planning a video later this year where I'll talk about perennial cover plants because I, I think that's a great idea. But definitely the diversity, great plan for the garden. And, and that diversity can be different for all of us. But just add diversity to your garden, whether it be adding uh, the, the, the herb plants, adding flowers, adding grasses like the ornamental grasses. All of those different types of plants will attract different types of beneficial insects. And so the more diversity you can add to your garden, the, the better chance you're going to have at natural pest control and pollination because you're attracting uh, everything that is coming to the garden that you want coming to your garden. So uh, that's wonderful. I think that's a, an awesome way to, to approach it. Uh, Elan Cater saying we're right on the coast, so we rarely get snow. That's one of the things about the, the British Isles in the UK is the, the latitude is farther north than I am. But because of the Atlantic Ocean, they don't get the snow that some of the rest of us that might be in the Rocky Mountains are supposed to get. And so uh, I, I think it's a good thing that you don't get the snow. You've got your greenhouse and so you can actually be growing some of the things that that I can't grow. So that's awesome for you. Uh, let's see what else. Nice to see everybody throwing in all the information that, that they have. Um, Mage Gray Wolf, I, I want to offer my condolences. Their, their gerbil died this week, but raised a point early on before we started about using that the bedding in the garden. And we don't often talk about that, we talk about manures and we talk about cover crops and compost piles. Uh, my kids had white rats when they were growing up. And so that bedding for, for rats, for gerbils, for rabbits, that can be awesome material to use in the garden. I've always put it into the compost 
because some it often has woody material, but then it also has the droppings. It might have a little bit of food that is mixed in. And so the greens and the browns are already mixed together, which is why I like to put it into a compost pile. But it can also be a great mulch, depending on what, what bedding you're actually using. If you're using the wood shavings as the bedding for those small animals, that can be a really nice light mulch in your garden. So great idea. Uh, sorry that you lost your gerbil, but definitely put that bedding to use. And, uh, and if you have pets like that and you're cleaning out the cages on a regular basis, don't toss that. Put it in the compost pile or use it as bedding in or as mulch in your garden. And uh, I bet you you'll, you'll like it. Mal is coming up to say hi. And so she was barking outside. She's been doing her roaming uh, this morning like she normally does. And now she's trying to see what I'm doing. We'll see if she starts chewing on her bone right next to me. Uh, okay, let's see. Dustin Light says, I covered much of my garden with two layers of cardboard and a layer of dead leaves back in September in hopes of killing off any grass or weeds that had crept in. Good idea or no? I, I think it's a great idea. And I've actually been doing that in my front yard as I reclaim the old dead dying grass and the weeds that I have as I'm putting down a couple layers of cardboard. Uh, what I do... Uh, and would encourage if you have soil and or compost, go ahead and put that on top of the cardboard and then add the mulch like wood chips or in your case, dead leaves. And so, uh, in fact, I, I just did a video where I'm talking about creating good soil from bad soil. And that's the basic idea. You put down the cardboard, you put down the leaves, you put down compost, you put down whatever organic matter you have, and definitely a good idea. It, it will smother out the plants underneath it. And if you add more leaves and compost and soil, you can actually start planting in it uh, come springtime. If you don't add all of that extra organic matter, you can still plant, but what you'll need to do is dig hole or cut holes in the cardboard and then plant into the soil underneath the cardboard. So the cardboard in essence is a mulch. It's smothering out the weeds and whatever's growing underneath it. It's doing the same thing that mulch does. It, it's insulating the soil. It's, it's protecting the soil from damage. It will break down. So it's adding organic material to the soil. But to plant in it in the first year, you'll need to, to dig through it and get down to the soil unless you make the effort to add soil on top. And so that's what I'm doing in my front yard is I'm, I'm putting the compost or I'm putting the cardboard down. I'm putting the, the leaves and as much compost as I have. And then I'm putting amended soil on top of that. And then I'll be putting seeds in that amended soil. And so... I'll end up with about four to five inches of soil on top of the cardboard, but over time it's going to break down. And by the time those seeds root next year, they'll be able to grow through the moist cardboard that will be buried underneath the soil. So yeah, there's, there's lots of ways you can do it. Uh, but, but that is, that is a good idea in my opinion, if you want to reclaim some of your landscape um, with plants like grass that you you don't want anymore and want to get rid of. So, okay, let's see. PD is wondering, any suggestions on mitigating white flies, in my case with brassicas? Uh, yellow sticky traps can actually be quite effective for uh, white fly control. And so I did that uh, uh, around my eggplants this year and and not only caught the the white flies that I was having a minor problem with, but a number of other of those little flying pests. And so the yellow sticky traps is really about the easiest uh, and, and most efficient way I've found that you can deal with the white flies. You can, you can do some other things, including neem oil, um, which has mixed results with, with, with white flies in particular. Uh, but try some, some sticky traps. Um, they're easy to find. They don't cost much and they really are pretty effective. Scott Smith says, when using leaves as compost, do you need to be concerned about what chemicals are put on the grass 
under the trees that the leaves come from? Uh, not really. Uh, it, it depends. Now, if what was sprayed and and my my brother-in-law Steve did this a couple years ago, he actually had a problem with with white flies and some other insects in his trees, and so he had a company come in and spray the grass around the tree with a systemic pesticide, the kind of pesticide that the tree will actually absorb through the roots and then send up through the tree into the leaves so that when those insects are eating leaves, that it'll kill the insect. So if you know that there's been a systemic pesticide sprayed on the grass, then yes, that could be an issue. But as far as fertilizers, chemical fertilizers, it won't be any issue. If it's a, a pesticide or an herbicide that is sprayed on the grass for the purpose of controlling the weeds or the pests on the grass, then it's probably not going to be any issue as far as the tree and the leaves are concerned. If the leaves were sprayed directly with an herbicide or pesticide, then it might be a concern. Uh, but but generally, no, I'm, I'm not that concerned at all with with the leaves. And, and most of the chemicals that you might encounter when the leaves dry out, well, whatever volatile chemicals that were in that leaf that were related to a pesticide are going to dissipate as well into the atmosphere. And so it really isn't that big an issue. And, and as far as concerned about, no, I, I, I generally am not concerned about those kind of issues when it comes to, to the tree leaves. Now, the grass clippings is a different story because there might actually be fresh chemical residue on grass clippings. So I, I am hesitant to use the grass as a mulch or even in my compost pile if I know it's been sprayed. Um, but not so much the the, the tree leaves. Uh, North Chester County News. Ever grow mushrooms in five-gallon buckets? What is the proper temperature to keep the medium to get the spores to grow? I haven't done them in five-gallon buckets. I've, I've grown mushrooms in straw bales. And much of it depends on which type of uh, mushroom you're growing. And they, they prefer, of course, darker, cooler, wet, moist environments. And when I was growing them here in Colorado, I did this this, this last spring, um, they did great in early spring. But once it started warming up and the sun started sh shining, they did terribly. And so I think most of the mushroom ranges you're going to see probably do great around 60 or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's in the... Um, the 15 to 21 Celsius range. Uh, that's probably a really nice target, which is why you can grow mushrooms in your house because most households have an air temperature like that. When they start getting warmer than that, and that's when I saw when my daytime temperatures were climbing up to 75 degrees and 80 degrees, that's 26 Celsius, the, the, the mushrooms just stopped growing. They, were, they dried out so quickly in my dry air and uh, I just couldn't keep them growing outside. So cooler is is definitely better. <coughs> and then as far as the medium, uh, there's there's lots of flexibility there. A lot of times it it is the moisture that is more important. Now, the fungi that produces the mushrooms, fungi is is going to want to feed on woody, carbony, uh, materials. It's it's the collagen in the wood that they're eating. And so you'll want uh, something like uh, a potting mix that is made from forest products, ground up wood bark or ground up wood, actually. Those are the kind of media that, that typically mushrooms will grow best in. And so if you buy a, mus a mushroom kit uh, or you get mushroom compost, You'll often find that it's it's pretty woody. It's got a lot of woody material in it, and so those are generally the best type of media that you're looking for. Uh, which is why a, a, a straw bale, which has all that that carbon material, uh, they, they grew pretty well in 
a straw bale. That's because that's what the fungi is feeding on. And then we'll produce the mushrooms, which are the fruiting bodies of those particular fungi. So uh, uh, five gallon buckets can actually be pretty well, do pretty well. I, I saw, I think I saw a video or I read a, an article, I forget exactly where I saw it, but, but they used um, five gallon buckets where they actually cut holes in the five gallon buckets. And so they filled it with a woody um, soil mix and mixed in the spores. And then the mushrooms grew out of the holes that were cut into the sides of the five gallon buckets. And so if, if that's what you're thinking, go for it. If you're thinking about just growing on top, cut some holes in it because the, the mycelial threads that will be growing through that material from the fungi, as soon as they find an, an opening, like a hole, <clears throat> that's where they're, they're going to fruit and that's where the mushrooms are going to come from. So uh, great experiment, great great option to try to, to do something new is with mushrooms. Shandy's Garden, hello to you. My New Year's resolution is to finally get the whole roll of weed fabric across my whole backyard. That sounds like a big project. I bought it a year ago, and I've got a greenhouse I bought a long time ago that needs to go up. Great resolution, great project. And that's the idea is to come up with something that you've been meaning to do and make a resolution for it. And so let's talk a little bit about resolutions. Um, I'm not a big New Year's resolution person. You know, as far as um, exercising or dieting or any of those things that a lot of people make resolutions for. Uh, but when it comes to gardening, I do try to come up with some resolutions each year, something I want to try, something I want to do that that I didn't get accomplished or hadn't done uh, in in a previous season. And, and so the reason I want to talk about resolutions today is because it's easy to make a resolution but it, it's often difficult to actually keep the resolution and to move forward with what, what you're hoping the resolution to accomplish. And so here's some tips. A resolution is basically just setting a goal. And because we have a date on the calendar that we can say we're going to use this date to set some goals for the upcoming year, it makes it easy to look at January 1st as an opportunity to make New Year's resolutions. So when we're setting these gardening goals, one of the most important things to do is to actually write it down. And so just this first step, that's one reason I asked you to go ahead and comment, because just by writing it down, you are more likely to keep the resolution. If you just think about it, if you just verbalize it to yourself, you might keep the resolution. But as soon as you write it down, as soon as that pen or pencil hits the paper, now it, it locks into your brain at a slightly different level. And you're more likely to actually achieve the resolution. You're also more likely to, to keep that resolution if you tell somebody about it. So write down the resolution like you already have, and then tell somebody that you want to do that resolution like you're doing in this case, you're writing it down for for the, the, the Gardner Scott community at this point. And just those two steps are going to make it more likely that you will achieve that goal, that that resolution will actually happen in the next year. It's, it's also good to be specific. And so a, a lot of this, and I've seen people make this comment before, my resolution for this year is to spend more time in the garden. Well, th that's hard to measure, and it's really not specific enough to, to be an achievable goal. And so a better resolution, a better way to write it down and to tell people would be something like, this year I resolve to spend 30 minutes a day in the garden every day. or this year i'm going to spend an extra hour on saturday mornings drinking tea and spending some time in the garden something that's quite specific that you can actually measure and you can attain that particular goal the 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 next step when you you have made that measurable goal 
is to actually try to come up with a plan. So let's say that your, your resolution is to spend an extra hour in the garden on Saturday morning. Well, how would you do that? You have to have some plan in place to actually achieve your resolution. So the plan might be that you're going to set the alarm clock an hour earlier, or you're not going to uh, sit in your chair and read the newspaper indoors. You're going to go outside to read the newspaper. You need to plan to actually achieve the, the resolution. And so uh, in, in this case, as far as like rolling out the fabric, so what's the plan? That's a great resolution. It's, it's measurable. It is attainable. But now what are you going to do to actually make that happen? Are you going to set aside a weekend in April to achieve that resolution? Or are you going to do it uh, one, one day per week for four weeks? You really need to try to be specific to actually be able to sit back at that point and say, yes, I did achieve my resolution. And then you, you visualize it. So visualize when it's complete. And so if you have this goal of laying out fabric across your entire landscape, well, visualize what it's going to look like, not only when you're done laying out the fabric, but when you put the mulch on top of it and when you put the trees in or whatever you're going to be using that space. When you can visualize what the finished product will be, then it's easier to do each of the steps to get to that point. And so that's as, as I'm doing my greenhouse, and this is actually um, fits very well with, with one of the resolutions that I've made for this year is as I am building my greenhouse, I'm going to build a sitting area within the greenhouse, a nice little brick pad that I'll have a chair, and that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to spend time on Saturday mornings and as much beyond that, but, but I think I can get away with doing Saturday mornings, and if I can achieve Saturday mornings, then I'll expand beyond that. I don't want to set a resolution that just says, I'm going to spend as much time as possible in my greenhouse, in my chair, reading my emails, drinking my tea, whatever it happens to be. Instead, I'm really going to focus on Saturday mornings in the greenhouse in spring as I'm preparing the plan for my garden season as a simple resolution. And if I only do that four times in April, then as far as I'm concerned, I will have achieved my resolution. Then I can expand beyond that in the future. And it may become a habit. It may be something that I end up doing every day is going out to the greenhouse and drinking my tea and just enjoying that garden space. But as far as a resolution is concerned, it needs to be much more specific, something that I can actually say I've achieved. And then you reward yourself. You say, I, 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 I did it. I, I actually was able to make a resolution and keep the resolution. And don't think that you only have to do this once a year on January 1st. And so that's how I'm approaching this as we move forward, is that I'm thinking in terms of the, the four Saturdays that I'm going to try to do in spring. And if I can achieve that, then it becomes more than that. And so at the beginning of summer, I'll set a resolution. It may end up being too hot in the greenhouse for me to do this, but I can modify the resolution and still keep the same basic intent. So I'm going to start with drinking my tea on Saturday mornings in the greenhouse, but I'm going to see if I can accomplish that. If then I turn it into just sitting in the open garden during the summer on those Saturday mornings instead and enjoying the birds and the insects and everything else. So, so resolutions can actually be an evolving concept within your own garden. And so we'll get back to, to laying the fabric. If you're able to lay the fabric and you accomplish that, well, now let's take that same idea and you're going to cover that fabric with something. I'm assuming something like wood chip bark. 
with mulch, well, now you can just shift that to another area and say, hey, we accomplished this. The task is done. Now I want to mulch all of my garden pathways, or now I want to put in a cover crop around all of my garden beds. That's how these ideas for resolutions, I think, really work best in the garden because you take one idea and it, it figurative, figuratively becomes a seed to grow and expand everything you're doing in the garden with that same basic idea. So there's some quick ideas, some thoughts about resolutions. We'll keep talking about that as we proceed. Shout out to Colorado Bird Nerd, another wonderful member of the Gardner Scott community. Thanks for signing up again. Appreciate that. Lama Lama says, my garden resolution is to really focus on what we eat and just a bit of experimenting. Also to implement many more flowers for pollinators. Great resolutions. All those are, are absolutely wonderful ideas. Uh, growing what you eat, experimenting the, the flowers. Uh, those are all things that I think we should be doing on a regular basis. But again, unless we write it down and we tell somebody, it just kind of becomes a jumbled activity. Now, with it being precise, you can develop that plan and you can make it happen. Earthly spaces, my resolution is to grow more veggies, which I like to eat, instead of those which are just easy to grow and feed my fancy rats. I hear you. I, 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 so, I grow so many veggies. I did that this year. I grew uh, a, a lot of eggplant. And I ate some eggplant. I'm not a big eggplant person, but I grew eggplant just to grow eggplant and have success with it. And, and that's a big problem I have, is just growing plants to have success growing those plants without thinking so much about what it is that I like to eat instead of those that are easy to grow and feed the rats. And I fed my worms an awful lot of my harvest this year. So that's a good one. Choose, choose what you like. And it's one of those things that you're much more likely to keep growing those things and spend the energy growing those things. And, and uh, it, it's really a good way to go. Mayor Baron Maine's asking about Chip Drop. Chip Drop uh, is, is a wonderful service that, that is used uh, throughout the United States. I think they've started doing some of it in Canada as well. And so if you go to getchipdrop.com, you can sign up. And not all communities participate in this. So it actually took two years for me signed up on Chip Drop to actually get a drop of chips. And so what Chip Drop does is they work with arborists in, throughout the country. And an arborist who has signed up with Chip Drop, when they're out pruning trees or chopping down trees and they put it through their chippers, they have a truckload of wood chips. Well, they have to go drive and put it into a landfill, which often costs money. If they can partner with a gardener or a landscaper who wants those chips, they're more than happy to drop that load. And if you're that gardener, you get that load. And so I actually got a load this year and it, it happens real fast. There was a truck in my area that was pruning some trees. They chipped it up. I had signed up. They came and dropped it in my driveway and I now had a load of wood chips. And so it's a great way to get wood chips. Uh, it is, it's free. They, they do suggest that you, you tip uh, through the chip drops uh, site, the, the arborist. And so uh, I, I did offer some money and, and paid a little bit for the load just because I was glad to get it. But uh, great, great opportunity to get from some free wood chips at uh, getchipdrop.com. So always a nice option if you're looking for those kind of things. Okay, let's see. Lisa's saying, I love that beautiful garden in the background. Not like that in Colorado right now. I love the channel. Thanks, Lisa. So this actually comes from Frank Russell. And so thank you, Frank, for the background today. Frank lives in Victoria, British Columbia, which is a beautiful, beautiful area in Zone 9. And so they're not dealing with the snow that, that we're dealing with right now, for sure. If you ever consider visiting British Columbia, Canada, make a trip to Victoria. And if you make that trip to Victoria, 
go to the Bouchart Gardens, which are incredible gardens just outside Victoria. So I did this probably about 10 years ago. We did a vacation to Victoria. Absolutely fantastic, fantastic municipal garden in the Bouchart Gardens. It, it's just absolutely incredible. One of the best gardens I've ever seen, and I've seen gardens around the world and around the country. So fantastic gardens in Victoria. And you can actually drive to the coast as well and go through a rainforest. In Canada, there's actually a rainforest outside Victoria. It's just a fantastic area. Lots of opportunity to grow lots of plants. And as you can see in this picture, Frank and his three generational family is doing an awful lot of growing. And so uh, I, I really appreciate this. Now, as you might guess, this is a picture from a few months back, but they're still growing uh, a lot of primarily root crops in these beds. But there's just so much about this garden that's wonderful. Look at this fence and look at this trellis that they have right here. They just have a nice little raised bed and then they have a nice little trellis and they have all of these vining flowers growing up the trellis. How fantastic is that? Back here you see a great example of a bed with hoops and there's no need to put a cover on these hoops at this point as the plants are growing. But over here, this looks like it's a fabric to keep the insect pests out of that bed. And so particularly if you're starting a, a fall garden or even in springtime, works great in spring. If you have those little seedlings and you have the insects that want to eat those seedlings, well, you put up a nice fabric cover over your hoops to keep the pests out while those seedlings grow. And, and you don't need to grow. This is kind of a misconception that a lot of gardeners have, thinking that our plants need to be exposed to the pollinators to grow. Well, in our vegetable garden, there are very few plants that need to be exposed to pollinators at any point in their life cycle. You can grow lettuce, you can grow carrots, you can grow beets. There is a ton of crops you can grow that never need pollinators. So if you have a big pest problem, you can grow under a cover like that through the whole season and the plants will do fine. If you're growing something that does need a pollinator, well, then you take that off once the plants are big enough that they're not going to be eaten by a lot of those pests we have. And so, so I've said this many times, if you can identify the pest you have and then learn about the life cycle of that pest, putting a simple cover like this up at the point that those pests would be feeding on your plants that's all you need to do. And that might only be a two or three week window that those pests are feeding. If you can disrupt their feeding cycle, they're not going to return. You just pull off the cover and continue growing in the garden. It's a, it's a great way to garden. So I love seeing that. There's a nice trellis in this bed. If you look back over here, look at that. Nice little sitting area with some colorful chairs. This is just a beautiful garden. I, I really enjoyed this, Frank. So uh, appreciate you, you sending it. And then you can also see they've got an umbrella so they can sit in that little sitting area in the heat of the day and just enjoy the garden space. And so nice little spot. Well, there's a lot that's being grown here. And you can see, uh, and this is the way I do it too, raised beds. And they don't have to be tall raised beds. You can see that there's wood chip mulch in the pathways and uh, nice, clean. Everything is kept in its little place and the plants look wonderful. So uh, glad you asked that question, Lisa. And thank you to Frank Russell for sharing the picture today. And if you have your garden pictures that you want to share, and they don't have to be current, you can send me pictures from this last year. You can send pictures from right now. If you've got two feet of snow on your garden, then go ahead and send me a picture of what two feet of snow in your garden looks like. I'd love to, to show those as a background picture as well. So just send your pictures to Gardener Scott at gardenerscott.com. Full size pictures do best. Uh, this, this picture was actually an 11 megabyte picture and that file size is ideal because I can show it in the background and you can see 
a lot of the detail of the picture. If the, if the picture size is less than one megabyte, sometimes it's, it gets grainy and it doesn't show well on the background. And then just give me permission to use your picture in the live stream. And like Frank did, I'll talk a little bit about it. If you share some backstory like Frank did, talking about his grandkids living with him now and how they've set up this garden and they approached it from a from a wonderful strategy one little piece at a time and reclaiming a little section adding a bed here and there and now look how wonderful it looks so uh appreciate the story appreciate the picture i hope to see yours soon okay let's get back to the show daniel manser saying what do you think of using pine needles as a pathway mulch i've had a hard time getting wood chips on a budget but pine needles are everywhere actually uh, I used pine needles first in my pathways let this last year in particular from my neighbor I had five or six big bags of pine needles and I actually put pine needles around all of my garden beds first uh, and then actually ran out of pine needles and so that's when I added wood chips and then I also added wood chips on top of um, the the pine needles, just kind of make a a, a double um, uh, a double layer with the pine needles and the wood chips. And so, a great idea. In fact, pine needles I think are among the best mulches for pathways. There, there is you do need to be a little bit careful. So when I put the pine needles in, I make sure and walk through and stomp on them pretty good because they can be a, a tad slippery when they're, they're full size and you first put them in place. But they take a long time to break down. Uh, they're, they're free, especially if you've got a lot of pine needles in your area. And it's a great way to use those pine needles. So go for it, go for it. Definitely use the, the, the pine needles in, in your pathways. And I've been doing that for years and years in fact actually um, i used the last of them uh, in that bed I, uh, that i did the video for a couple uh, weeks ago but i usually try to keep a bag a big bag of pine needles in reserve so that if they get we, we had 90 mile an hour winds here recently and that did blow some of the mulch around a little bit so i try to keep a bag in reserve to replenish the mulch on the pathways and pine needles is what I use to to do that. So great, great idea. Lars, Lars says my main goal this year is to solarize my main wildflower garden. The weeds got out of hand. Great idea. And so again, what I would say, Lars, is um, set a date, set a plan for when you're going to do that, because solarization is a great way to kill weeds. And so you take you take a big sheet of plastic for those of you that, that don't know you lay it out over the area it helps to anchor down the edges so that you don't have wind blowing underneath it and and then you just let it sit for a period of months and the sun will shine through the plastic and it effectively becomes like a little magnifying glass and it heats up the soil underneath and smothers all those plants underneath and kills all those weeds. So solarization can be a very effective way, large scale, like, a, like in a big area, in this case, a, a wildflower garden, to kill all the weeds underneath. Now, you are also killing a lot of the soil life in those top couple inches. It should recover pretty quickly because all those dead plants that were killed through the solarization process will break down once the bacteria zip back to life and it adds some good organic matter to the top of the soil as all those plants break down so great way easy way cheap way to kill a, a lot of weeds in in, in a big area uh, but because it takes a number of months to be effective that's why i say lar go ahead and set a plan as to when you're going to do that you might want to start in April and then have that plastic in place April, May, June, July, and August. And then you take it off. The sun, summer sun will have killed everything. And then you can go ahead and, 
and top that area with some compost and some mulch put in some seeds in the fall and then you're going to get your wildflower garden back next that would be the spring of 2023 with few weeds great soil and you leave those seeds in place over next winter to vernalize and i bet you'll have a, a wildflower garden that will be the envy of your neighborhood north chester county news says i have a big bucket of miracle grow stopped using it can i add it to compost a turbocharged nitrogen sure absolutely um yeah mir mir depends on you know miracle grow has different um types of fertilizer with different ratios of the nutrients uh, but assuming that it, it has a high nitrogen component yeah absolutely that's and, and i've done that before i don't do it option but but i actually did that uh a number of years ago when i had a bucket of miracle grow that i wasn't using it was just sitting in the shed and my compost pile was getting really slow and i did the exact same thing through some of that that uh, fertilizer into the compost pile if you're really a stickler for organic gardening and you're making your own compost to use in your garden it, it's up to you whether you think using the the uh, miracle grow in your compost disrupts your organic philosophy uh, that's up to each individual to decide but as far as is it beneficial for the compost pile Yes, adding that nitrogen can be beneficial to the compost pile. Susan Baker, nice to see you. Don't worry about being late. Good morning back to you in Florida. Nice to see you here. Groovin Bird said, this new job is really biting into my gardener's got live stream time. Glad to be here for what I can. I'm your hero. Thanks so much for that. I don't try to be anybody's hero, but I appreciate that that sentiment. And, and I'm so glad because um, we have uh, I've seen a few of these comments today from people that are on holiday or have some time off between Christmas and New Year's and they're able to join us today I haven't seen Kiri check in she might be here um, but she checked in last week and uh, and had some time off to be able to do that so if Kiri's there maybe she'll be checking in here a little bit later uh, I'm guessing that they're either out busy doing something or uh, maybe she'll be checking in here soon rudimental gardening one of my goals for the 2022 garden grow fewer varieties and focus on getting quality harvests for the veggies we enjoy the most great idea i'll be talking a little bit about this basic concept when we get to the philosophy phase um, about um, focusing energy so i like that idea i i i, I think you know still variety overall variety in the garden having all those flowers and those grasses and those herbs and those vegetables and the trees and the shrubs and the bird houses and the water features that's the way to have a really uh, healthy garden environment but when it comes to actually what you choose to grow in your beds i think that's a wonderful uh goal and i'm i've actually i haven't set that as a specific new year's resolution of my own but as I'm going through my seeds and as I'm developing my garden plan for this year, I'm taking more of that approach. I'm going to be growing fewer different varieties of tomatoes, for instance. And instead of growing lots of different squashes and lots of different cucumbers, my plan right now is to just grow one type of cucumber and then save the seeds now we don't have to worry about cross-pollination with different types of cucumbers and the same thing with the squash just grow one type of squash so that i can save the seeds because really that's what i find is i'll grow all these different types and i really only prefer one i'll i i i typically will grow zucchini and crookneck squash and usually butternut squash well I find that I really don't eat much of the crookneck squash. I eat, eat a lot of the, the, the zucchini. And this, in fact, just uh, for Christmas Eve dinner, I made butternut squash soup, which was fantastic. But there's no reason to grow a lot of things that you really don't end up eating. I ended up giving away all of my yellow crookneck squash this year. It was great to the people I gave to, but really, should I be growing that? Or should I be focusing on the stuff that I'm really going to be using myself. So I think that's a great idea. 
and definitely something you should move forward with. There's Kiri, and I'm glad that you're here checking in. Uh, Kiri's my daughter and a moderator, of course. For those of you who don't, I don't know why I was making a big deal about Kiri. We had a wonderful Christmas together, so I'm glad to see you here today. Um, Renato saying, I'll be using the KISS system. Keep it simple, stupid. I tend to make things more complicated than necessary. Great idea. And and I do the same thing. Too many of us do, where we, we do make things more complicated. And if you can simplify your gardening, it is so much simpler. And so do keep it simple, stupid, if you can. And uh, then you become more of an expert in that particular area and you can expand. And as you become more complex and as you do add that variety, it is so much easier to control when you've already figured out the basics and the simplicity aspect of it to now add beyond that point. Joe's Crayons, hello to you. Sometimes there were roses that grew in my backyard how long do roses last until they die? That's a good question. It depends on the rose. Uh, and so there are a lot of vining bramble roses that will last centuries. Here in Colorado, you can actually go into the mountains to some of these little old cabins that have been there for 150 years, and there will be roses growing around those cabins. At the Air Force Academy, where I retired from the Air Force, there are a few of those spots on the Air Force Academy because that land was settled 150 years ago. And you can find areas that still have a lot of those roses that were planted by the settlers all those years ago. And so some of those type of roses will last a long time. But then you have some more recent hybrid roses that may have been developed for some um, special blossom or special color. And those don't necessarily last as long. A lot of them can be very finicky. And so if the conditions aren't exactly right, they might only last four or five years before they start fading or before the plant doesn't do as well. And so completely depends on the type of rose that you're growing and this is one of those do a little research if you can and find out more about the rose when if you if you buy plants and there's a lot of of companies out there that sell the plants uh, a lot of these nurseries will have the story behind the particular rose so they might be able to tell you that this is a rose from such and such a garden that was developed in the 1920s or developed in the 1930s. And that's a real good clue that that rose is going to last a long time. So uh, completely depends and uh, depends on your particular environment, if it's perfect for the rose. But like here in Colorado, in the mountains with the cold and the dry and the snows, and some of these roses have been growing naturally without anyone taking care of them for over a hundred years. So. If a plant finds a place it likes, it's going to live for as long as that plant is capable of living. And roses can live a very long time. Okay, Shandy's garden saying, I would really love to have a pair of climbing roses at the entrance of my garden. So I'm looking into that soon. Great idea. That's actually part of my long-term plan. Uh, it, it's going to be the last area I'm planning on developing. I want to do a nice formal herb garden just off of my deck and I, I'll be redoing my deck here in the next couple years and then I'll be putting in the herb garden but that's my plan too to go from my front yard to my backyard garden area to go through an archway and on both sides of the archway I'm going to have climbing roses so great vision um, I think it's a classic gardening idea <coughs> And so good luck to you. I think that's definitely something to, to move forward with. I'd hear no, Mala barking. Hopefully she's not interfering with your background noise. Obviously there's something that's happening out there. Heidi says, uh, roses grow for many years, but after many years the base gets woody and that woodiness keeps getting higher on the plant and it makes it hard to prune down in winter. At that point, I replace them. Thanks, Heidi. That's, that's good advice. Uh, the 
uh, and I think the bramble roses, that's one reason why some of these bramble roses do so well is because they'll send out new shoots at the base and each of those shoots will grow into a new plant. And so uh, good point. If it's a, if it's a rose that's growing from a single base, uh, it, it will age faster and it won't basically replenish by sending out new roots and new plants from the base. Made a garden says my mother grew a pink miniature rose called Cecil Bruner that grew for many, many years and became a huge bush and focal point in our backyard. That's a nice memory. I like that idea, being able to grow something that actually becomes generational. Um, <laughs> Whitey says my dog is responding to Mala. That's funny. Uh, she, she normally only barks like that in the house if there's somebody in the front yard. And it might be a dog walking by, but I hear that she stopped now. So it was probably a dog walking by and uh, it dog's gone now. So she's not barking anymore. That's funny. Lila's saying the same thing. <laughs> dogs are barking at Mala. So I'll, I'll let her know that she's had an influence on some of the, the dogs in the background. Mayor Bear in Maine resolutions. Don't keep trying what doesn't work in my area. More flowers and more flowers. Leaf mold like crazy. Great ideas. Uh, Maine is such a tough region. I lived up in northern Maine for four winters many, many years ago and would, would never have even thought of starting a garden at that point. That was potato country, Rustic County. Lots of success with potatoes. But beyond that, there aren't a lot of gardens because it is a tough area. So, uh, and, and here in Colorado, I have the same issue. So many things in a tough area that just don't work. So great resolution to stop trying to grow things that just aren't going to grow and instead focus on the things that are going to grow. And leaf mold, I'm doing the same thing, making more and more leaf mold. So wonderful idea. Good resolutions. Definitely go for that. <clears throat> yeah, and Susan says, uh, tough to grow in Maine unless your blueberries. Uh, blueberries can actually do real well. The, the high bush um, blueberries that come from that region and just do so well, don't do so well when you get into other regions. So there are some things like the Maine blueberries that are just unlike any place else. Scott Head's checking in. Hi, Scott. Another great channel that you should definitely subscribe to is the Scott Head Black Gumbo channel. Uh, and so I'm planning next week to actually talk about the Single Seed Challenge. Scott just had his video come out where he talks about the Single Seed Challenge. And so this will be the third year that we're doing the Single Seed Challenge. I'll save that for next week and we'll talk more about it. But definitely check out Scott Head and uh, see what he says about the Single Seed Challenge. I'll be talking about it a little bit on the live stream, but I'm also planning on doing my own video about it, which is kind of part of the idea of it, that we can all do videos and show what we're doing with the Single Seed Challenge. So there's a teaser for some more coming back next week, but glad you're here, Scott. Thanks for checking in. YD says, I'm not going to try single seed. I killed too many seedlings. That's also another, another great way to approach the resolutions if you if you if you're doing something and it's not working you really should stop doing that thing modify what you're doing or do something differently but but that's that's the definition of craziness so just stop doing that crazy thing that you're doing that's not working and if your case it's the, the single seed um that's that's one way to approach it we'll talk about the the single seed challenge and uh, how that actually approaches. So like the eggplant I grew this last year, I actually grew, I think I had 22 or 24 eggplants. One of them was the plant that I was doing for the single seed challenge. And it actually did great. Last year I grew a black crim and it got killed in a hailstorm. And so my single seed challenge was over a month after I started. But uh, the, the idea is going to be a fun one, so, and we'll talk more about that next week. Um, YD says, I was overwatering, trying to do it better right now. <laughs> and, you know, and that's, that, I've talked for weeks now about analyzing your season, taking a look at what worked and what didn't work. And that's a great way to approach your, your resolutions as well. Rather than trying something new, 
or doing a new plant or doing something different in your landscape uh, or building something as part of your garden. It could be something as simple as watering correctly. And so the, the resolution becomes that you're going to try to avoid overwatering. And then part of the plan for that is learning more about watering, understanding what plants need, because different plants need different rates of water. And I, I think that that can be a great resolution is, is how you garden. Go ahead and make a resolution. If you've noticed that you're doing something that just isn't working out quite right, not the wrong plant, not something with the way the garden is structured, but just how you're doing it. Something simple like adjusting the way you water your plants because you've learned more about watering your plants is a great way to approach the gardening season. Nancy saying, I've tried my whole life to grow roses. I'm 67 and I never have good luck. So disappointing. I'm pretty good at the other things I do and I've quite an extensive garden. I just can't grow roses. Don't feel bad. When we lived in California in the San Joaquin Valley, the, the bread bowl of America, we had roses in the backyard and I did nothing, nothing. I didn't know much about gardening at the time, but I did nothing to those roses. And they were beautiful and just covered the fence. And my grandmother and grandfather had lived in that same town uh, years before. And I remember her rose garden in, in that town. That was Merced, California. Beautiful, beautiful gardens of roses. I have roses. I actually have two plants in my garden right now. They don't grow more than about 18 inches high. Now, granted, they're small teacup roses. It's everything I can do to keep them alive here in Colorado. So don't feel bad because I want to grow more roses as well. And so that's one reason why my archway with the climbing roses is still a couple years away because I still have a lot more to learn about roses before I plant those roses in my garden. And uh, if, if, if it's hard to grow roses, don't feel bad because for a lot of us, it's hard to grow roses. And um, <clears throat> I think sometimes you just have to be lucky enough to live in the right region and have the right variety to have those beautiful rose gardens. Some of us, I'll be very happy if I can just get a couple plants to grow and, and then just move forward with that. Uh, and Heidi's asking a good question. Have you tried growing roses in large containers? Yeah, that, that actually can be a, a, a good solution. If you find out that it's the, the location, the soil, the temperature, uh, there's a lot that growing in containers might be able to give you that advantage of being able to, to grow roses in your area. So great idea, Heidi, to think about modifying where and how you choose to grow your plants. And there's a good suggestion from a Sabi gal too. If you want to grow roses, check out your local Rosarian organization. They're chartered to help newbies. <clears throat> and so there's a lot of organizations like that. And there's a lot of clubs that that will focus on on a particular type of plant. And and I actually have learned we have an iris society here in town that grows irises. Uh, different types of viruses, different varieties of viruses. Every year they have a, a, a sale of the, the iris uh, plants that they that they are, are sharing, and they have a ton of information. And a lot of Rosarian organizations do that as well, where they're just focused on roses, and they're more than happy. The video I've got coming out here in a few days talks about that. When you're trying to garden uh, and save money, but also, if you're trying to garden and develop knowledge, join one of these organizations because they are more than happy to share with you all their knowledge, even plants and seeds. And so great suggestion, Masabi Gal. If you're having trouble growing any type of plant, find an organization that is focused on that plant, but especially roses. They, they're actually pretty organized, some really cool uh, groups around the country, around the world, that are focused on roses. So really, really wonderful idea. Ladies garden at home. I keep a to-do list on a sticky note every week. Great idea. Only garden to-dos in January. I transfer last year's stickies to this year's calendar. That's a great idea. Um, I have a pad of paper that I kind of do that same thing, 
but I like the idea. Make it simple, do some sticky notes, and hopefully the to-do list gets done uh, relatively quickly, but kind of like we were talking about earlier with the resolutions. Once it's written down, you're much more likely to accomplish it. And so sticky notes, great idea. I'll be doing a video here in a couple weeks using the same basic concept with plants using your calendar and figuring out when you're going to start your seeds, when you're going to put the plants in the ground and figuring out based on a calendar. Because if you don't write it down, at least in my case, if I don't write it down, then it really isn't a plan and is less likely to happen. So great suggestion. Thank you for that. And sticky notes is uh, one way to do it. And Burry says, keep my garden journal up to date. Another great resolution. And so this is one of those, you know, be specific. Rather than say, keep my garden journal up to date, uh, instead to actually make this resolution happen, say, every Saturday morning I'm going to write in my gar garden journal. Or on Mondays I'm going to write in my garden journal to say what's going to happen for the week. And on Saturday I'm going to write in my garden journal to say what happened over the course of the week. So try to be specific about when you're going to write in your garden journal and it's much more likely to happen because I I had this resolution for years, almost exactly this. This year I'm going to do more in my garden journal. And then at the end of the season, it's like, oh man, back in April, I really meant to write about that thing in the garden, but now I can't remember what that thing was that I was going to put in my garden journal. So if you get into that regular pattern it's so that it can become a habit, you're much more likely to to take advantage of your garden journal because every Saturday morning when you're sitting in your greenhouse in that space you developed with that cup of tea, you can have your garden journal and write down what happened over the previous week. So there, you've just helped me add to the resolution that I already had. Journaling in the space that I was going to spend time in in the garden, might as well use that space to make some notes in my garden journal. So see how the resolutions can be an evolving thing. I've just taken one resolution and turned it into two resolutions and it's really the same thing in the same place at the same time so and says my puppy got worried when mala barked so I'm, I'm guessing there was a dog out there which is why her bark affected all the other dogs uh, she she does that occasionally we'll be outside and the other dogs will be barking 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 and she doesn't respond at all and then suddenly she'll be in the house and there'll be a dog bark and she goes running outside and starts barking too. So whatever the dog language is differs based on what they're talking about. And it's funny to see the reactions and hear about the reactions that dogs have because of a particular bark. So um, that's interesting. The psychology of dogs and noting what we what we recognize with them. That's funny. Uh, OK, let's see what we have. Uh, happy holidays back to Richard Robbins taking a day off to spend some time with you all I, we all appreciate that Richard glad you could be here today uh, I, I know a lot of you are regular viewers on the replay and so it's always great to have people that would normally be watching on the replay here live so uh, good to see you here Scott says I often lean too heavily on my garden tour videos as my journaling but then I don't always record everything that is going on. And I'm with you, brother. Um, that's one reason why I really started making more videos for my channel was to use my own videos as my own personal journal. Now, of course, I'm sharing the information with everybody, but that's a big reason why I choose some of the videos I'm making and the angles that I shoot with so that I can see for myself what's happening. And especially as I'm building out my garden, I'm doing a lot of that so that I can look at videos from a year ago and compare them to videos from this year and be able to see the progress I'm making in my garden. So I'm doing the exact same thing. But when it comes to things like what, what I made note of this week, where we had sustained winds of 42 miles an hour, and then we had gusts of 75 to 92 miles per hour, well, that's the kind of thing that might be worthwhile putting down on paper in a journal. And I didn't make a video about it. And if I 
hadn't written down that it happened this last week, it would have been forgotten. It just would have been that memory of that. Remember that storm we had? So doing both is definitely a good idea. And uh, I, I wish you luck with that because I'm still struggling um, making notes in my actual garden journal, which is why the idea of choosing a time on Saturday morning, sitting in my greenhouse, drinking my tea, and putting in the notes in the journal, for me at least, could be a really good resolution. So uh, I like that idea. <clears throat> Lisa Potter, you're my favorite channel. So helpful. Well, thank you for sharing that. I appreciate it. I do try to to get the information out there and try to get people motivated. So I appreciate that feedback. That's awesome. Uh, Jay saying, Scott, Gardner Scott, bark is a relevant garden topic. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that, that it is, it, it is, uh, it, it depends on which kind of bark we're talking about. So I appreciate that little bit of a pun, Jay. Thank you so much. Uh, Renato says, there's an app from Seed to Spoon you can keep track of what you grow. I need to use it more. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. If you're looking for a way to actually track what you're growing, check out Seed to Spoon. I'm not aware and familiar with that, but if you're using it, I think it's a good idea. Pat says, I write in my journal on Monday mornings just before the Gardener Scott video. Ask myself, what would I report to my online gardening friends? Great idea. I really like that idea. I spend Monday mornings... Um, reviewing information that I'm planning on talking about and, um, and, and, you know, try to get prepared for the live stream. But, but I like that idea. That's because, because I, I'm going to be talking about what I did the last week in many cases, and it fits with the, for all of us, fits with the idea of what we're going to be talking about on the live stream. Might as well be writing about it in the journal. I love that idea, Pat. Thank you so much for sharing that. Nomathemba Zwadala says, I will keep my garden journal up to date. Most of all, labeling what I planted because I always forget to do that. Great idea. And, and I think it was last week I talked about the uh, the garden journal. She calls it the garden book that this, this friend of mine shared with me from the garden club that I belong to. And that's one of the big thing she does in her garden book is to actually have a scale map of her garden and that's how she keeps track of what's in the garden is she'll identify it on the map and then she'll have a page in the book that talks about that plant and with pictures with the botanical name with all the aspects about that particular plant is a beautiful way to to, to journal. So I, I, if that's what you're suggesting, that's a wonderful uh, goal and a wonderful way to put together a, a garden journal. And, and what I do, which isn't nearly as effective, is I just save all the plant tags and then I can refer to the plant tag. But I don't necessarily remember where that plant was. So a lot of times I'll have a plant tag with a flower and I have to wait till that plant grows and flowers to remember where that plant tag actually um, came from. And so labeling and keeping track of what you have, great way to, to, to consider journaling. And yes, you're exactly right. Keep up with it so that uh, you can, uh, it, and it's, it's not so much the short term, it's the long term. Those of us that plan to garden for a long period of time, and are choosing plants that are going to be around for a long time, it, it's so easy to remember when you put that plant in the ground all those years ago, and then to have forgotten what the plant was. You remember the event of the planting, and you forget what the plant was. And I've done that way, way too many times. And so Shandy's asking, has anybody ever mapped out the garden and numbered all the areas not only to have a reference to where you're putting everything, but also help manage it weekly so you don't get overwhelmed. Yeah, but <clears throat> that's actually how I did the Galileo School Garden because that garden, we had 101 raised beds that we were actively growing in. We had four raised beds that we used specifically for instructing the students. Then we had the greenhouse, and within the greenhouse, we had three different levels of beds. And then around the greenhouse, 
in the 24,000 square feet area, we had fruit trees and fruit bushes and, and plants of all different types. That was the only way I could manage that garden was to do exactly that, to map it out. Each bed was actually numbered on the map and I actually painted the numbers on the beds so that when we had the students out in the garden, we could uh, start right away. And so the plan for the day would be to put uh, seeds in beds three through nine. And so I could give the students the seeds and say, you, you students go plant in, in bed number three and you students go plant in bed number eight. And it was a very efficient, very effective way of gardening. I haven't taken it to that level in my own home garden, but I have done the same basic idea within my vegetable beds where I've drawn out the, the map of my vegetable beds. And then as I come up with the plan each year of what plants I'm going to grow in those beds, then I go ahead and lay out the plan with the seeds and where those seeds are going to go and figuring out succession planting. So, uh, yes, that's definitely something that that I do. And it is a great way to avoid being overwhelmed because you can uh, figure all that out ahead of time. So however many garden beds you have, go ahead and figure out your plan right now. And so I'm growing right now or planning to grow, I should say, in six raised beds, the four by eight beds for my vegetables with my succession gardening plan. I can figure all of that out in January or February or March when I'm not actively growing. And then I get the seeds together or I start the seeds indoors to get the plants ready to go. And that plant is all figured or that plan is all figured out. And so now come May and June, when I'm doing most of my planting, I just take the plan that's already been developed and follow it. And it's so easy to do that kind of gardening. If you if you do have that feeling of just being overwhelmed by there's just so much, break it down into little pieces and start working on those pieces well in advance. And I bet you you'll actually find that you have some, some good success with it. Uh, and thinking of doing a permanent set of markers uh, to, to use numbers instead of names because I don't always want to grow the same stuff. <clears throat> good idea. And, and I think I might have mentioned that when I was doing the, the winter gardening video I did last year. I think I talked about that. Um, that was the plan I had. Um, though I didn't do winter gardening this year yet because we actually haven't had winter yet. And it's just been so warm. But the containers that I was using for winter gardening, that was my plan is to number the containers with that same thought in mind because each season or each year I'll be growing different things in those containers. It does make it easier to just number the container and then have that separate sheet of paper or spreadsheet that you're keeping track of what's in that container or in that bed. So uh, that can be a, a really nice way to approach it. Darcy saying a frosty minus 38 C in my Alberta garden this morning. Glad to have Governor Scott live to remind us of the sun. It is sunny here. Minus 38 C is almost minus 40 Fahrenheit. There you have it. Nice little tidbit of information. Just two degrees C away from being the same as the Fahrenheit chart. Uh, Melissa checking in. Nice to see you there. Finally got up early enough to see us. It's so nice to see everybody that is, is checking in today that isn't normally here. And... Uh, and just great shout out to everybody that is participating today. It, it's so nice. And Luna Cat says, good morning as well. Good morning back to Luna Cat. Richard saying, have been reading how borage and nasturtium are good companion plants that keep bad bugs away from squash and how nasturtium helps with aphids. Absolutely. And I have both borage and nasturtium, not as much nasturtium as I would like. In fact, I was just looking in seed at seed catalogs this weekend and um, trying to figure out some different varieties of nasturtium to grow. Great plants. And, and I've mentioned this before. In the greenhouse at the Galileo Garden, we had nasturtiums growing in the doorways and on a, a, a trellis. And that was the reason, was for the aphids that would find the greenhouse, they would attack the nasturtiums first. And, and the borage also plays a very similar role. Borage is a great plant 
to grow uh, for a number of reasons. You can eat it. Also has wonderful flowers. It's great for pollinators. It, it's a wonderful plant to use for a number of different reasons. Uh, but part of that is the pest, the natural magnet pest uh, option where it attracts some of these pests that are coming to the garden and they'll leave the other plants alone. So you're exactly right. Jim Edgar, thank you so much for that super chat. Jim Edgar from Seattle. Big snowstorm this weekend. No plants left unless you know a secret. Wow, snowstorm in Seattle. Uh, the this is, a, this is a perfect opportunity for journaling and and actually doing some analysis of getting out and seeing what was damaged in the garden and what is surviving. And, uh, and it, it's, it's incredible what you'll find. So I mentioned that we uh, had a rib roast at Christmas. Well, I went out, I grow horseradish, and I wanted to dig up some horseradish root to grate some fresh horseradish on the rib roast that we were having. The frozen or the, the soil was not frozen. Every year that I can remember when I tried to harvest horseradish in December, the soil was frozen. And so as I, I started digging around this plant that looked like it was dormant, all the leaves were dry, I saw that my horseradish plant is still alive. It still has very small leaves that are growing from the crowns of the horseradish plant. This is the kind of thing that I suggest doing if you have a big snowstorm at a time of year or in an area where you don't normally have a big snowstorm is get out in the garden and actually get down and see what happened to the plants. So you say no plants left, you might be surprised to find out that some of those plants might still have some little green growth. And maybe it's just the leaves that died or were or underneath the snow. So use this as an opportunity to actually see the, the plants up close one by one and it, and it could give you a new, a new appreciation for the plants. And then if this has become a pattern because of all the crazy weather we have, you can see the plants that didn't make it through the snowstorm. And next year, plant plants that are going to be more likely to survive in the event of an unexpected snowstorm. So I, I see this as a great opportunity. As far as the secret, uh, you have to act ahead of time. And so if you see that the snow is coming, that's why you do things like this. You put up the hoops and you put the cover over the hoops. And that's how you can protect your plants is with hoops and a cover or with a cloche. You can just take a gallon milk jug, cut off the bottom, stick it over your plants, and that's often enough to help those plants survive the smaller plants in the event of an unexpected snowstorm. Even something as simple as just a tarp, just a, a, a tarp thrown over your garden beds is often enough to protect the plants from an unexpected snowstorm. So a lot of this needs to be done beforehand. But after, after it's already happened, yeah, take it as an opportunity to get out there and learn a little bit more about your plants because you might be surprised about what's still growing and, and help you next year as you develop the garden and grow more plants and, and choose uh, just exactly how you're going to approach the garden to include putting up some hoops like that around your beds to be ready for it. And that's what I do in the springtime. I leave my hoops up all spring just in anticipation that we might get an unexpected snowstorm and I can go out and throw plastic over those hoops. <clears throat> okay, let's see, Joseph saying, my dogs hear a bugs outside and run out and then start barking. Squirrel is the biggest culprit. That's, that's good, but it, it's so good to see everyone that's got the dogs and the dogs are reacting in a number of different ways today. Luna saying, has anyone ever used raised garden planter blocks instead of nailing it together I'm considering using them. I haven't, um, and and that that's definitely, especially if you're not sure if, if, like for a new garden, if you're not sure of the exact location of where your garden should be or whether you want it to be, you can use those planter blocks. And basically you just slide the wood in and you create a raised bed so you don't have to nail things together. That makes it really, easy to move those beds at a later point 
Uh, or if you are in an area with a lot of snow and you and you're you're not going to be gardening in the winter and you might be thinking about moving it's another way you can just pull up the the boards and and store the boards and your raised beds away in the garage for the winter so if you're looking for portability and ease of use uh yeah those can be a, a nice way to do it i haven't used them i'm sure some of the rest of you may have so if you have go ahead and share that information with luna cat and so as we move towards the end i want to share a, a basic idea with you and so we we often talk about you know gardening being hard that's the video i did recently and and one way i think to to make it easier but also one way to really help us become experts more knowledgeable and to really take our gardening to the next level is to try to break down what we're doing into individual pieces and so if you think about it every aspect of gardening is a different job and so when we when we start seeds we put our seed starter hat on and then when we take care of our seedlings we put our seedling grower hat on and then when we put the plants out in the garden we put our transplanter hat on and to keep those plants alive we put our waterer hat on and so each of these tasks we do in our garden you can approach it as you're wearing a different hat and think about all the different hats you have to have in your closet to be a gardener all of these different activities requires that you wear a different hat well here's how you become an expert gardener this is how you get to be the point like I am after 30 years plus of gardening I've got a lot of hats in my closet what you do is instead of just putting a hat on and taking it off wear the hat keep that hat on for a period of time so pretty soon many of us are going to be starting seeds when you put that seed starter hat on leave that hat on for more than just the time you're going to put seeds into your mix do some research do some reading do some experimenting learn everything you can about starting seeds so that that hat now isn't just an indicator of the activity that you're doing that hat now actually becomes an identifier of who you are and what you have been able to attain on your gardening journey and so if you focus focus your energy focus your learning focus your attention to whatever the hat is that you have on at that time it will make you a better gardener it will make you a more knowledgeable gardener and don't think that you have to wear all of the hats and learn about all of those hats in a particular season <coughs> this ties back with the resolution idea pick a hat pick two or three hats don't really go beyond that pick just a few ideas that you really want to learn more about this year and next year when you put that hat on it's going to be second nature you're going to know so much about seed starting next year because you focused on the be becoming a really good seed starter this year that it becomes second nature and you can do it without even really thinking about it you'll still learn more as you make mistakes and as you not try new things but you don't have to worry about the basics of that particular task so what hats are you going to put on this gardening season that are going to become a focus for you to really develop your gardening knowledge and to really develop your gardening skills with that hat in mind we were talking about roses earlier and the rosarian society i know gardeners that have a rose grower hat and that's one of the only hats they have in their closet they don't have the vegetable garden they don't have much more in their garden than roses and they get with other gardeners and all they talk about is roses they've got their rose grower hat on they've specialized in that and that's what makes them happy as a gardener 
So seek out what hat is going to make you happy as a gardener. You don't have to wear all of the hats. You don't have to own all of the hats. I just encourage that you select a few hats that are going to fit with what you like to do in gardening. Now, I like everything. I like the building. I like the designing. I like the planning. I like the growing. Occasionally, I like the harvesting, even though Frank and I forget to harvest as often as we should. Each of those is a different aspect of gardening, and each of those is one of those things that we can become an expert on. It's hard to be an expert on everything, but you can focus and you can wear that hat and when others see you doing that activity, the figurative hat you have on your head makes you noticeable to all of those around you, and you really become the expert that others will seek out within your families and friends and neighborhoods. And so if you belong to a garden club, and every garden club has these type of members, there are certain members that wear their hat with pride because they're an expert at growing roses, or they're an expert at growing irises, or they're an expert at growing vegetables. Or even if they're not an expert, they've been wearing that hat longer than you have, so they can at least share some of their information and some of their knowledge, and you can benefit from their experiences. So choose a couple hats this year. Next year, you can put those hats in your closet, pull them out when you need them, and then start focusing on some of the other hats that you're going to wear. And as we talk about next year, it's happening next week. So next Monday, it's going to be 2022, and I'm going to be here doing this all over again, starting up another year when I hope to continue for many more years to come. So great to have you all here today. Thank you for sharing your time with me, and I look forward to seeing you next week, next year, on this channel. I'm Gardner Scott. Enjoy gardening.